Hi, uh, my name is uh, Ying Hui, and uh, I'm currently teaching at the uh, Department of International and Strategic Studies, University Malaya in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia. So today I'm going to share with you uh, some of my thoughts about impact of Indo-Pacific geopolitics on China-Southeast Asian relations. Um, in fact, my main research areas are mainly uh, dealing with the intersections of human rights, democratization, and civil society actors in the Southeast Asia. So as a researcher, we are exposed to various narratives while we are conducting our research and many other things, which has come uh, as a challenge. So today, uh, this topic, it doesn't sound very much related to my core um, research areas. However, somehow for me, uh, the linkage could not be ignored because uh, as a Malaysian, we're so used to the term Asia-Pacific, but not Indo-Pacific. Yet, uh, from time to time, I've been exposed to this specific term, Indo-Pacific, and I'm trying to understand what is the meaning of Indo-Pacific because Indo-Pacific, the term somehow in uh, Southeast Asia, it is always being used as a term that a form of containment against China. So whether is it true or is it not true because uh, when I venture into human rights uh, as in looking at the China's influence, I could not ignore this particular term because it is very much linkage with what uh, I'm um, doing. So, for me, in a broader sense, uh, the divisive notions of uh, Indo-Pacific is a reflection of the normative um, power in actions. So another reason for me coming up with this topic is that uh, I have recently, um, well, I was recently in India, and uh, attending a program on Indo-Pacific uh, uh, related matter. And uh, you know, if uh, you know India, and then there's a, when we talk about Indo-Pacific, we are also talking about Quad. And uh, we have India, we have uh, Indo uh, we have India, J uh, Japan, Australia, and the United States. So during that particular program, um, it was attended by some Southeast Asians, and it was attended by mostly South Asia and the representatives from the embassies uh, in uh, from Japan and many others, particularly the members from the Quad. So, but what's very interesting is that the uh, whole agenda has become just against China, and that has somehow sense. Uh, made people, uh, mostly Southeast Asian, feel uncomfortable, discomfort. But that particular sense is coming from the fact that Indo-Pacific is not really a term that is very popular in Southeast Asia. Rather, it is ongoing. So based on all this experience, I was trying to understand how far these terms Indo-Pacific is moving in the context of Southeast Asia and what is actually the narratives while we look at the China's influence because it could very often backfire on how people are feeling with that particular uh, term. So I'm going to see this uh, with uh, four questions here. Very briefly, this is my only slide actually. There's no more other slides. So I'm going to tackle these topics uh, from the four questions here. And I'm going to turn it around with, uh, you know, there's so much of a talk about uh, um, many studies on China's presence in Southeast Asia that tends to focus on how the evolving power dynamics in China and its influence uh, in, in the region. But I want to tackle this question by looking at how does Southeast Asia see China instead? So turn it around. And so, China has been ASEAN's largest trade partner for 13 consecutive years. That is a fact. And in the state of Southeast Asia, the 2022 survey that produced by the ASEAN Studies Center at the ICS Yusuf uh, Ishak in uh, Singapore, China is recognized as the most influential economic power political power, strategic power. That is also a fact. So, but that opens up to a lot of nuances when you look at a lot of surveys that are available because China, while they maintain as a, 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 a big powers in terms of economic, strategic and political powers, but they are the least trusted partners. So that's a very strange 
uh, puzzle. Why are they the least uh, trustable partners in the context of Southeast Asia, yet they are the most powerful uh, ones in terms of these three spectrums. So there's also another uh, survey that conducted by the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia that uh, actually also reaffirmed the same statistic that um, in the top five areas of ASEAN-China cooperation, trade was the uh, um, aspect that most of the people are actually uh, yielded the most satisfaction and followed up by investment. So it's economic power. That is very clear. So in contrast, they have been plagued with a trust deficit among Southeast Asians, despite of its uh, overwhelming contributions. So the answer is clear here that the Southeast Asia need China for the economy reason. How do we um, um, tackle this challenge where when you talk about economic power, it directly goes into the general public whereby they do want the China presence. So it can very often, the narratives that were put up can be really counter effective. So the question here is why China doesn't elicit the same amount of trust among the others? So China assumes that Southeast Asian countries are willing to boost any form of economic development at the expense of their autonomy. But if you understand ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, they work in a different way. So ASEAN centrality is the top. And that is something that you can't deny. And while many criticisms against the function of ASEAN, especially in the work of democracy and human rights, but they have been able to really stand very strong in terms of protecting their autonomy. Yeah? Because they don't give in. Because there's a lot of uh, sometimes uh, comparisons made between the EU and ASEAN, but they can't be compared. They are just simply not the same. ASEAN works in a different way, and there are many criticisms about it is non-interference, so you can't do anything. Not so. If you live in Southeast Asia, the narrative is not the same. Non-interference is how, make, how it makes ASEAN strong. So that is another spectrum. So, if you look at the uh, Chinese economic engagement and the uh, influence, it has basically run parallel with the expansions that sort of threatening the region because we do have issues with China when it comes to maritime dispute, territorial dispute, especially on South China Sea. So, those are the ongoing ones. So, on the other hand, Many in the West argue that China extends its global influence by exporting and imposing its developmental model on other countries. But this has to be examined in a more nuances in which if you go on the ground and you speak with the people, especially uh, for, for instance, if I may, to take the example of Timor Leste that I work on, almost all of the markets are actually owned by Chinese from China. So they run the business in the small little country of 1.2 million people. So if you ask whether are they happy with it, no, they are not. Can you do without them? No, we cannot. So that's the dilemma exactly what's happening on the ground in a lot of countries in Southeast Asia. Human rights violations happen, but they can't live without the Chinese present, even though they don't feel uncomfortable. They don't feel comfortable because one of the human rights training that uh, we conducted with the uh, uh, lecturers at the uh, universities of uh, East Timor, the only public universities, when we asked what is a human rights violation, the human rights violation is that Chinese take away our businesses. So it is very strange because we don't, we never have that. In the Southeast Asia, we will say, okay, our freedom of assembly, our freedom of speech, media freedoms. But for them, they see one of the uh, things about Chinese presence. But in terms of a bigger, broader picture about foreign policy, it is very important. So they need to live with the Chinese uh, presence. So Chinese presence in Southeast Asia, having said that, it is not by monolithic. It involves not only the state, but also the non-state actors. So they play a very important role, the business people, the civil societies, and many others. So the second mistaken assumption by China is that Southeast Asian countries are willing to submit exclusively to a single power's uh, um, um, influence as long as it is beneficial. No, Southeast Asian nations are not uh, 
uh, in that category. Hence, it comes to my second question. How, <clears throat> how have different Southeast Asian stakeholders um, reacted to Indo-Pacific? As I earlier on, I mentioned, um, Southeast Asians, uh, uh, if you look at the 11 countries now that Timor-Leste is on its way to become our, the official member in the ASEAN, Indonesia is the leader when it comes to championing on the Indo-Pacific because they can afford to do so. They are so big. They have the population, they have the economy, but for the rest of the countries, uh, for instance, if I take uh, 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 Malaysia, we have been quite silent in that. We have a think tank, uh, um, ISIS Malaysia, that has been having this Asia-Pacific roundtable. So in 2019, in which there's a lot of talk about Indo-Pacific, including uh, we uh, in ASEAN, they came out with this um, ASEAN documents when it comes to Indo-Pacific, is that they say, no, we cannot change the name to Indo-Pacific Roundtable. It will maintain an Asia-Pacific Roundtable. And it is still quite limited uh, uh, research is being done to look at the terms of uh, Indo-Pacific. So if we look at these documents, ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, AOIP, that being released in Bangkok on the uh, 31st, uh, 34th ASEAN Summit, it's very interesting to actually read every single uh, um, language and the terminologies that the ASEAN leaders are using. What they are avoiding is that they do not want to become the contestation between the US and China. Because the, the Indo-Pacific in the context of Southeast Asian is really being seen as something against China as simple as that and full stop. But Indo-Pacific has to offer much more than that if you want to buy in the narratives of the people or believing what is Indo-Pacific really are. Although it started from Japan and later on during the times of um, uh, Trump's administration. However, it has not really been uh, uh, taken off in the context of um, Southeast Asia. So in the context of uh, um, uh, Indonesia, because Indonesia is a big power when it comes to Southeast Asians. So they have been playing a strong role and uh, at least a more vocal role uh, when it comes to Indo-Pacific. But if you look at the ASEAN uh, declaration on the Indo-Pacific, they basically are silenced when it comes to the military cooperation. What they are talking is really about developments and any other possible areas of cooperation and on the SDG as well as the maritime uh, cooperations. So having said so ASEAN still has divisions on the level of support for the Indo-Pacific uh, concept. But if I move beyond the Southeast Asian context, that is to move uh, around Asia, I would say India plays a very strong role because India wants to emerge as a bigger power. Hence, Indo-Pacific is one way to go. This actually sets quite a challenge for me as an academy because we have now uh, received uh, or, or more opportunities when it comes to the topics that if I want to write about Indo-Pacific, really. But again, it is also depends on which angle that I want to write when it comes to Indo-Pacific, because the definitions of Indo-Pacific itself is not even clear. And especially in the context of Southeast Asia, nobody is clear really about this Indo-Pacific because China has the trade relations and the free trade agreements. Of course, in the Indo-Pacific, there's the IPEF that is ongoing. But more people are looking at RCEP and uh, many other free trades with China rather than IPEF. Because if I may move on to the next uh, uh, questions, that is on the whose interest the Indo-Pacific doctrine serves. So if I may, to just uh, bring your attentions uh, um, to the recent uh, elections in Malaysia, that is, uh, we have a new prime minister, uh, Anwar Ibrahim. So uh, what's very interesting is that when I uh, um, look at, I'm, I'm not a person with uh, who look at strategic uh, studies or so forth, but I like to look at speeches because in ASEAN context, speeches, statements are very, very crucial. Every single word means something for, for them. So when I look at the congratulatory uh, speech coming from the US, and also the other one coming from China to the new Prime Minister, Anwar Ibrahim. Anwar Ibrahim is a leader when it comes to 
you know, it is he's being labeled as pro democracy and he's labeled as a reformist. So if you look at the uh, U.S. Secretary of State's the speech, so it has included the word democracy and human rights, and he also mentioned about um, the. Indo-Pacific in his speech, uh, actually. So if I may read, it said, the um, 15th general election is a demonstration of the power of democracy. The US and Malaysia have fought a robust, comprehensive partnership relations Ship rooted in close economic, people-to-people, -people, and security ties, and we look forward to deepening our friendship and cooperation based on shared democratic principles and rule of law. We remain committed to working with Malaysia to advance a free, open, connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient Indo-Pacific region. But in the context of Malaysia, when previously when we had uh, Mahathir as our Prime Minister, he go against Indo-Pacific. He doesn't believe in Indo-Pacific term because for him, it's just against China, as simple as that. However, uh, when we changed administrations to another prime minister, they started to look at Indo-Pacific but only looking at IPEF, the economic framework, because economy is really important, but not in terms when it comes to you know, the power of the uh, United States and many other things as well. So if we look at the speech by the, um, the state congratulatory uh, statement by Premier Li Keqiang of the State Council, he said, China and Malaysia are traditionally friendly neighbours facing each other across the sea and bilateral relations have sustained a sound momentum of development. The two sides have continuously consolidated political mutual trust and deeper mutually beneficial cooperation, positively contributing to the peace and prosperity of both countries and the region. So it is not the same statements, but they looking for the peace and prosperous of both countries and also the region by, of course, not talking about Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific. But if you look at Japanese Prime Minister in his congratulatory uh, message, he said he has emphasized free and open Indo-Pacific. Canada has included the specific term inclusivity. This specific word, inclusivity, well, for, for us, and I'm, we are not talking about the SDGs, inclusivity, but here, when in the terms of the Indo-Pacific, inclusivity is a term that the Indonesia actually use. United States did not use inclusivities, but they say free and open. So Canada actually include these inclusivities. And uh, Indonesia, in many documents and in whenever talk about Indo-Pacific, they have mentioned that inclusivity. So inclusivity is in directly, it means they do not want to be with any side. Indonesia, who's uh, more of the championing of the Indo-Pacific narratives, say inclusivity because they do not want to be in the middle. They do not want to have the terms of uh, Indo-Pacific that is only being seen as against China. So they want to change that particular narrative by say inclusivity. They want to be friends with all. And that is generally the, the, uh, what happens on the ground when it comes to uh, Southeast Asia. So now the final question. Why Southeast Asia opts for a more... Um, neutrally stand on Indo-Pacific. Sorry, if I may go back to whose interest the Indo-Pacific doctrine serve, as I mentioned just now, that uh, within the discourse of the Indo-Pacific, I have mentioned about what? But there's another AUKUS as well in 2021, which is new. However, both are seen as the responses to growing imbalance of power brought by the China's rise. So, uh, Let's face this frankly and openly that the discomfort and contestation signals to ASEAN that they need to reclaim the Indo-Pacific ideas. I think this is basically what I found in my preliminary studies on how to reclaim the idea of Indo-Pacific because they do want to be within all these, you know, the Quad, the AUKUS, the Indo-Pacifics and many other different informal and the formal networks uh, when it comes to the global 
politics, but how can they actually reclaim back the ideas of the Indo-Pacific because now it is under Biden. During the Trump's time, it was different. But under Biden's times, it didn't actually help too much when it comes to the language of the democracy and the human rights uh, on the ground. Because whoever who done studies on Southeast Asia, you know, democracy and human rights are not popular words in the context of Southeast Asia, and you can't sell that. Once you sell that, it's very challenging. No, no state leaders who are actually going to buy in with you want to expand the democratic space in my own countries. That is something that is more scary. So that is the nuances that is very important to look at on how, uh, what kind of narratives that this Indo-Pacific um, is. So why Southeast Asia opts for a more neutralist stand on this um, Indo-Pacific? So the question is, in another word, means... Um, Southeast Asia wants to be friends with all external power and uh, also to maintain its regional um, order. So if you look at the context of Southeast Asia, the domestic politics and the foreign policies is nuances in the great power rivalries. Leadership is very important in the context of Southeast Asia when you look at the US-China relations, but it, because it changed based on the relationship of uh, uh, the leaderships and who's the leader are really in the context of Southeast Asia. So uh, my final point here is if uh, we were to, to look at the China's rise as an uh, important actor, but we should not uh, really ignore that there is a uh, uh, very important for the Southeast Asia to continue to engage with the West, but at the same time, you can't ignore the China's uh, presence as well. So, having said having say that, um, I would like to conclude here uh, by saying um, it's important to look at the impact of Indo-Pacific um, geopolitics on the U.S., uh, on the um, China-Southeast Asian relations by really opening up the context of understanding uh, Southeast Asian politics. Without understanding Southeast Asian politics, without understanding how the ASEAN actually works, it would be really difficult to only talk about these big ideas of uh, Indo-Pacific that should not be owned by any specific leaders if it was meant to be. So uh, this is all for my uh, talk today. Thank you very much. I think uh, there's uh, four minutes. I was checking the time. So four minutes for question and answer if there's any, because it's a 30 minute session. Um, EU-Russia studies uh, background, so I would like to ask about um, the ASEAN position on the um, EU's understanding of China as a systemic rivalry, so how much of the element that this systemic rivalry element is endorsed in, within the um, ASEAN conversation on China? You mean from the EU? So uh, no, from, from the ASEAN perspective, uh, because for the European Union, they consider as the competitor, partner, as well as systemic rivalry um, regarding China, so, so how much agreement um, is shared between the EU and ASEAN on China? Right. Well, I am not sure whether I can uh, actually answer you comprehensively with that question because I don't really uh, venture into uh, EU. But uh, I think in the context of uh, Southeast Asia, EU, uh, EU is considered as one of the trusted partners together with Japan. Japan is the most trusted partner in, in most of the surveys that we actually see. And the EU is always um, somewhere in the middle. But uh, I think EU in the Southeast Asia, they run with the programs that relate mostly on democracy and human rights, um, actually. And they work very closely with mostly civil society um, actors. I think in the context of Southeast Asia, maybe the ongoing sum is about climate change and uh, environmental issues that they are currently also uh, venture in as well.
So thank you very much for the presentation. Um, one of the challenges you see in many parts of the world is the natural tendency to create a, a competition between China and the US. But from a local perspective and, and encouraging the agency of local non-governmental actors and maybe policy actors, what do you think is the best pathway for framing the discussion to deal with the real threats posed by uh, the CCP to the integrity of institutions and the ideas realm um, in, in the sort of environment that you've described? Okay. I, I think uh, um, I would like to tackle these questions from um, below as in um, the general public, because general public's views and elite's views are not the same. Chinese presence, as I earlier on uh, mentioned, while it might cause discomfort on the ground, but uh, they do want their presence. If you just uh, go in any country, so Southeast Asia, because the uh, uh, Chinese tourists are unable to um, enter the, our region yet for tourism. So you will get almost every taxi driver to say that, you know, they are waiting for the Chinese tourists to come in because they are the biggest. So in terms of economic power. So, but on the human rights side, yes, there's a lot of human rights violations, uh, land rights, environmental rights, and many other things. But I think the, the uh, really important thing is about <clears throat> these uh, um, narratives of democracy and human rights that are being uh, uh, put forward in the Southeast Asian countries really require a lot more understandings of what happens on the ground before uh, uh, putting up uh, any big ideas and uh, many other things, especially in the context of uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah. And I think the organizer says uh, time's up. Thank you very much. <laughs>